We're working on both wiring and cabling. So there's a, this is a big deal in the industrial workspace, cable installation. All right, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about electric boat, because uh, if you're not from the East Coast, the Northeast, or been in the Navy, you might not know much about our company. And I'm going to talk about two AR projects, Sparky and Argos. We're working on some development issues and some lessons encountered. Uh, I'm not sure how much we've actually learned. Um, and the, the slide format here is so they gave us this slide template with all the superheroes, but uh, one of the lessons that I've learned is that I feel working in AR makes me feel much more mortal than superhero-like. So uh, it's one lesson. Um, and uh, so electric boat. So we're uh, over 100 years old. Uh, we designed and built nuclear submarines. Uh, it was the company was really founded back in, uh, at the turn of the previous century by John Holland. It was a Holland torpedo boat company. It was the first modern submarine. And uh, we built the first nuclear submarine, the first ballistic nuclear submarine, and it was the founding company of General Dynamics uh, Defense Corporation. Uh, focused market, that is to say we have one product and one customer. So it's uh, kind of a niche market. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't recommend that if you're in the commercial sector, but um, submarines, so uh, it's a large complex platform, long design cycles, roughly 10 years long, slow build process, roughly ten year, five years from start to finish. Um, it's a mix of high-tech and low-tech, heavy steel like uh, Caterpillar or, or uh, bridge building or something like that, but there's also a, a fair amount of precision work, outfitting much like uh, building construction where you're installing stuff into small spaces, um, sort of the quintessential high-mix, low-volume where we we're producing one or two finished products a year. So. Uh, uh, again, a, a rather odd market. So uh, two projects I want to talk about. So I talked about this last year, the Sparky project. This is funded under the National Shipbuilding Research Program. And you can get information about it from this nsrp.org website. Uh, it's a two-year project, large project in the NSRP world. Uh, we're using a Google Tango tablet. We're, uh, we're using markers to localize the real world to the tablet, but we're using the built-in tracking of the tablet really to do the, the AR tracking, um, and we have an existing 3D wire model, and this is important that we have, we were, before we started, we were, our electrical design group had decided to model, going forward to model the wires as 3D objects using some built-in tool in NX, so we're provided that 3D model as data up front. Um, so what we're doing is, uh, do I have a laser pointer on here? Yes, no? No. Okay, so, uh, so on the left side, so what we're doing is we, the historical work product or the, uh, the, the disclosure to the to manufacturing was in the upper left here. It was just a table. It's a wire table. It's got connector information, uh, endpoints, wire size, wire length, wire color, which is always white. Um, and then what you're trying to do is use that piece of paper, just a 2D spreadsheet type thing, to build the thing in the bottom left. And uh, this would be fine if you did this every week, built the same product every week, you'd know how to do it. it would be a no-brainer. But if you do this once a year, twice a year, so you're six months between starts, and maybe you don't work on the same product the next time. So there's, uh, there's a lot of head scratching of how do I route the wires. We're trying to avoid that. So we're using a uh, Tango tablet in the upper right. Uh, we provide the table again to give them some context of what they're working on. But they pick a line in the table, and they get the 3D wire displayed on top of the real cabinet that they're building. This is wiring of electrical cabinets. So this is, you know, uh, computer box size or, or podium sized electrical cabinets. It shows the path of the 3D wire in, in context. Um, I think there's a movie if this will, yeah, this is playing. So, so this is some footage from our application. We got some NSRP branding. You have multiple projects available on the tablet store. This is a progress screen that shows you how many wires have been completed. That's persistent data gets saved over time. Again, we're using markers, just simple marker tracking to figure out where the cabinet is in the tablet's world. And then once we have that, we're just using the tracking from the tablet to uh, to figure out where we are. We can show the cabinet just to show that we're, we know where we are, uh, but we have a cabinet, so we don't need to show that. But, and we can show the entire wire harness. This gives a, an end product, so you get to see what it is that they're trying to build before they start. 
and then connectors. So these are all of the devices inside of the cabinet. This would have a front panel on it that was removed here. So there's uh, all the wires have to come out to the right to hinge where the cabinet hinges to open. And then there's a table. They pull up a table. The blue lines are done. There's a checkbox on the left. They pick a line in the table and they get the two connector devices and the wire drawn on top of the scene. Again, this is a tablet, so we expect to put this down in some kind of a holder beside the workplace. There's a, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a camera button that does a freeze frame on that image to uh, hold it so they can do work. And again, they, can, they do the wire, they click on the checkbox on the left, that gets persisted into that status screen that we saw coming in, so they know when they start how many, how many wires are done out of their total. Uh, yeah, so that's the pause, the lower right, sends them to a, a still image, they go back into a live camera view. Uh, what else is in here? Yeah, so when they go back into the status view, now they have six wires instead of four wires. So again, that, and that's persistent over executions of the program over time, all running on a handheld tablet. Okay, so we can, uh, all right. So, uh, so that's Sparky. Uh, um, what I was supposed to talk about from the agenda was, uh, was this Argos project, which is cabling. So this is big cables in room size spaces instead of little wires in cabinet size spaces. Um, I hope to have more to talk about with this, but uh, again, so this is another lesson learned is that even with augmented reality, reality still takes longer than it should. So, uh, so I don't have as much to show on this Argos project, but it, it's another National Shipbuilding Research Program funded project. It's primarily VR for uh, designers assessing cable designs up front, and it's uh, both large format uh, 3D projection on a large screen um, with interaction and then small format immersive headsets uh, with interaction. So it's uh, somewhat of a mixed reality where we're going to have cables in there that you can manipulate for, uh, for both design verification, design improvement, and uh, some, you know, some training up front. And then there's an AR piece for the installers. When they go to install, it will show them pathway, oh, excuse me, pathways of cables running on hangers that have already been put in place so they know where things go. Um, one of the significant things we're working on here is this markerless registration. So we're hoping to use, uh, we're developing an algorithm that uses planar uh, surface patches and captures those from the real world and then matches those to planar surface patches that have extracted from the CAD model ahead of time and then does a best fit to figure out where you are in that 3D space. Again, we're using the Tango tablet right now to do that. Um, and both of these projects are uh, uh, somewhat publicly available. So within the shipbuilding community, they are. I'm, I'm not sure to the, exactly the general public, but uh, they are publicly funded, but uh, somewhat restricted on data. So the, uh, these algorithms and uh, code may be available to you if you look. Um, some development issues. So, so we're working in a corporate environment and uh, we, uh, even though I'm in the, organizationally, I'm in the IT department, but I'm still just sort of a peon user, there's restrictions on what I can install on my machines. We don't have a, uh, we have a lab available, but it doesn't have access on the data side to our network. And so, uh, so there's, there's issues with what we can actually get done that make it problematic. Uh, sensitive data, so that the real data, I'm able to show you these because these are non-shipboard components, so they, these are releasable to the public, but we have to go through a process to get them released, so uh, most of our data is, is sensitive data, and so there's security issues that we have to deal with, and Android, so there's an oxymoron, right, sensitive data, Android. Um, so there's, there's issues there with, uh, with what we're allowed to do with these tablets, and going forward, we're, it, that's, a, that's still a bit of hazy. Um, uh, yeah, so we're using this Google Tango tablet as our platform for the time being. We have a, uh, we're looking at the HoloLens also, but haven't done much with that to date. And we've done some work with just uh, regular tablets with cameras and uh, laptops with cameras as well. Um, tools, uh, we're using Eclipse right now. We're, we're doing mostly just code development. We are working on uh, platform development 
tools, so uh, Boeing's way ahead of us on that, but we are looking at some sort of some basic capabilities using Unity, but uh, for most of our work to date has been just code, straight code development. When we started, it was kind of the tipping point of Eclipse and Android Studio for us. Uh, our regular Java developers use Eclipse, so that was easier because we could get, we had a built-in help desk. Um, Android Studio in a corporate environment is, uh, is problematic. I, it's, that's been my experience. So updates, every time you touch it, it wants, <coughs> it, excuse me, it wants to update something. And uh, so you need to be connected, but then if you're connected, then it constantly wants to update. So there's permission issues with what you can get. So it, uh, um, I, you may have experienced that. I, I'm, I use it at home some, and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, tools, so stackoverflow.com, you probably haven't seen that as a, an IDE development tool list, but, uh, but there it is. So that's um, it's one of our uh, primary development tools for, uh, so Android, maybe if you're, I don't know, maybe if you're under 30, maybe if you're under 20, it, the, the Android thing just kind of clicks and you get it, but it's, uh, for those of us who aren't, it's, uh, we, uh, we like Stack Overflow. So it's, uh, um, Software environment, so we're doing a mixed uh, Java, C++ on the, on the Tango, the, the C SDK has, there's it's really pretty even distribution of stuff back and forth between the Java and the C, and it would be a personal preference probably that uh, for me the C++ was, was better, but uh, you could do it all in Java if you wanted to. The, with the C++, it's kind of a one-time thing, you learn how to use NDK and JD, the JNI, and, then, it's, then it just works, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, we're using OpenGL for graphics, which actually is easier than on the C++ side. On the Java side, you've got issues with the graphics in terms of standard libraries. Um, we are able to use third-party code for open source code, so uh, in an odd turn of events, we're able to, in our restricted environment, we are able to download source code and then build it, and then we could say it's ours. So, so we've actually been able to build a lot of libraries that we use, um, and we can get things in. It's just it, everything takes time. But uh, we use CMake and the MinGW and the NDK tool chain, so you can actually build these C++ libraries to use, um, which is which is useful. On the so we've the Tango examples actually really good code in there for figuring out how to use the Tango. Most of our applications to date have been. You know, sort of uh, copied and pasted out of the, the Tango examples as a starting point, sort of a framework. Um, GLM for uh, vector math and uh, OpenGL friendly vector math. The Tango GL has some uh, OpenGL utilities in there, simple things. PNG, free type we started to use for some uh, rendering text to uh, textures for display. OpenCV we use for all of our image processing and Aruko is the, the marker library, although the Tango now has a, a built-in marker library. I'm not sure that it may be actually the Aruko. I'm not sure what, it, what it's using. Aruko uses OpenCV, so that's, that was easy for us to incorporate. Um, yeah, so data access. So uh, jumping right to the bottom. So the data is more important than the app. So in an in a industrial setting, it's... Uh, it's really about the data. So, and uh, if, you're, if you're having to do content authoring, which is not a term that we use for the kind of work that we do, but uh, if you're doing content authoring for your industrial application, then you're probably not gonna make any money. You're not gonna save any money um, because it takes a lot of time to develop data and your app and the data changes from time to time. You have to get the right configuration managed data. So you, uh, you need to know what data you're getting. We have some customized tools for both Katia and NX that uh, get data out that we can use right away. And we know what the data consists of, what it looks like, so we're able to use it right away. Um, this is a limited scope thing, so we're, we're not, it's not mobile device management. We're not pushing this <clears throat> to uh, lots and lots of devices. These are uh, manually managed peripherals that we're putting data on. The data doesn't change 
instantaneously, so you're using configured data, which is going to be good for the build project that you're working on. <clears throat> so uh, we have limited Wi-Fi available. So this is all data that's loaded ahead of time before you start. Um, the, yeah, using the, using the, you have to VPN into the network anyway, and all that's complicated on these little devices, just extra steps of logging in multiple times, complicated. Um, so yeah, so uh, we're really in this demo mode at the moment where uh, we are hoping to release the Sparky project as a production product by the end of the year for electrical wiring, but uh, we're still working on a basic framework. Um, we're, uh, we're working on a framework. Our, our framework at the moment is more of a copy and paste as a framework. Uh, the capabilities that you create can be then migrated in from tool to tool. It's pretty straightforward, but uh, we don't have a, a tool as framework that we're using at the moment, um, which we probably could make use of. Um, I think that's it. And I'm out of time. So, uh, yeah, so my contact info is here. Um, there's, I can talk to you about the National Shipbuilding Research Program, too, if you're interested. And uh, I guess I get questions. Yes? yes? Do. Okay. Uh, and, and so, we actually had quite a few questions. We've only got time for one. One. The one that got the most thumbs up. The most votes. America. Uh, America selects. Uh, how do workers handle following AR instructions with a handheld device like Okay, so yeah, I actually was gonna, I wanted to mention a, a point about, because you had talked about tablets, so we're using this tablet right now, and, and we've looked at, at the head-mounted wearable things. I, I would say that the, there's a basic trade-off of uh, the work that you're doing is, do you need a couple of minutes of instruction to do a half an hour's worth of work, or do you need constant instruction to do your work? Can you not do your work without seeing visual guidance in order to do your work while you're doing it? If that's the case, then you really need some kind of a head-mounted display. But the tablet, tablet's good because you can, you can get information and then you can put it down so you can do your work without wearing this thing strapped on your head. Or, uh, and in our work environment, the, the uh, hard hat's required, so you can't use a hollow lens. You'd have to use the Daiquiri helmet. Um, uh, safety glasses usually are required, so it's uh, uh, so I, if if the intent of this is how do you do your work if you're holding the tablet? So obviously you can't work with your hands if you're holding a tablet, but you can you can see visually the work that needs to be done in context of the actual part. So you get that whole visual memory of seeing the work on the part, and then you just set that down, and freeze the frame, set it down, and do your work. Um, if it's about work instructions per se, then, uh, then, then somebody else needs to give us a, a better tool for developing all those work instructions that we don't have yet, that, that we have, but they're on pieces of paper somewhere else and haven't been incorporated into the AR. So that's, yeah, that's somebody else's talk. Okay, thank you very much.